to another episode of Revival Cry. This is Eric Miller coming to you today. And you know, we're coming to you today from Williamsburg, Virginia. We're just kind of traveling through here, actually coming from Virginia Beach, where if you could see my shirt, if you're watching our YouTube channel today, it says Regent University Royals. And we're so proud of our eldest daughter, Sierra, who just graduated with her four-year degree from Regent University. It's an amazing story. You may have heard in previous podcasts and radio programs about how the Lord brought Sierra to the university, actually gave her a four-year athletic scholarship, and Sierra's always had it in her heart to be a missionary in Japan since she was 14, but was never really into athletics. And in short, the Lord just put it together, made it happen, even though she's grown up on the mission field in the Philippines with our family her whole life, and yet God had a way. And I just want to encourage you today to remember that there's always a way with the Lord. And, you know, none of us should ever think that we're at the end of our rope, unless we're doing things that we shouldn't do, then we might feel that way. We might feel condemnation, guilt, shame, but that's not the way Jesus wants us to feel. He wants to free us from all that. And I want to encourage you, friend, just to call out to the Lord with me today and listen to the word that I have on my heart to share with you today. I want to talk to you today about the dangerous steps of backsliding. I was reading in Numbers 14, and we'll just read verses 1 through 10. And let me give a little bit of background. In Numbers 13, we know that Joshua and Caleb, they went into the uh, land of Canaan. They went into to it as spies to kind of check out the land and see what it would be like. And yeah, there were giants that some of the other spies saw. And and yet Joshua and Caleb, you know, had a different spirit. And they came back telling Israel, we could take this land. This is exactly where God wants us to be. And the other spy says, no, we can't. And that's where we're at in Numbers 14. And so Israel right now is about to refuse to enter the land of Canaan. Let's start in verse 1. It says, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is ex an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them, Joshua, Caleb, Moses, Aaron, with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. And we know that Moses intercedes now for the people of Israel and God begins to judge those who are unwilling to go 
where the Lord is leading them. And God had his anointing upon these spies that he had raised up and chosen, you know, men of a different spirit, men of, of renowned faith, men that were faithful to the Lord and, and didn't go with what the world was saying. You know, these were, these were people who had encountered the God of the Bible and, and like in our day today, these, what we would say is these men were on fire. And, you know, oftentimes when men, women of God who are on fire, a lot of times that spirit of religion wants to come and just snuff it out. But that's not what God's going to allow to happen. And I want to encourage you, if you're in a situation today where somebody's tried to snuff out your fire, friend, don't make excuses about what's happening. Don't complain but be like Joshua and Caleb and, and Moses and Aaron and fall on your face before God. When others are lifting up their heads in pride, we fall on our face and trust the Lord. Amen? What are we talking about today? We're talking about the dangerous steps of backsliding. You see, Israel had already been wandering in the wilderness. They saw the great deliverance from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, the Egyptian army being destroyed before their very eyes, God providing for them in the wilderness, manna and quail and, and water when they needed it. And it was just amazing. Moses would go meet with God on Mount Sinai and and a cloud would lead them by day and a fire by night. I mean, friend, we haven't even seen a lot of that stuff in the church today. And we have a better covenant. And, you know, many of us, would say, people would say, you know, hey, I'm not going to believe unless I see. Well, Israel saw a lot. And yet they still didn't believe. Why? Because of our issue of pride. And a lot of times people want to follow God when when he's providing their needs and he's doing everything that they ask, you know, for or, or prayed for. And they feel like their faithfulness is a reason of why God should do something for them. Listen, I don't know what this situation is, but if our motivation is not just to do what we do for God because of what he's done for us, there's no other motivation that we should have. Because you see, you and I, we don't deserve anything. It is by grace that we are saved by faith. It, it is not of ourself that we can boast. If it wasn't for Jesus, you and I, my friend, would have no hope. But see, a lot of times we make up excuses to backslide because we love our sin more than we love Jesus who gave everything for us and said, if you're going to follow me, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. No matter what other people are saying, no matter how it feels or what's right, will you follow me? So we're talking about the dangerous steps of backsliding. And there are seven steps that I notice of what happens to the backslider. Either we can be on fire with those who have a different spirit and those are saying, man, let's go into the promised land. Let's go into the land of Canaan. God's with us. He's not with them. He's with us. Or we can go with the other crowd that says, man, all we eat is this manna. Even though God provides it supernaturally every day, we get familiar with things. And then we expect God to always do something more for us. And so the first thing that I notice here in Numbers 14 is that Israel, when they began to backslide now, instead of front sliding, they begin to lift up their voices and they cry and they wept that night. And so the first dangerous step of backsliding is weeping. Now look, weeping can be good or weeping can be bad. Weeping can lead us to God. Weeping can lead us away from God to where we begin to weep like Israel. And then we cry out because we have our hearts set on a different pilgrimage. We're, we're not allowing ourselves to be broken and walk with Jesus by faith. What we want is him for to do to do everything for us. And he's already done everything that we need to do. But yet at the same point. We expect him to do more than what he's already done because in our pride, it says that we deserve this. You know, the, the next point of 
of dangerous backsliding is number two is complaining. And let me tell you, complaining is always going to lead us away from God. It says the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in the wilderness. Friend, didn't Paul say, forget the things which are behind and press on to take a hold of that which has taken a hold of you? Listen, if Jesus hasn't taken a hold of you, then it's going to be easy for you to let him go. But see, it's not easy to let him go when you've given him everything. When you've given him everything, even when you mess up and you sin, you want to repent quickly because you know that he's so worthy and he's done so much for you. And friend, you might be weeping, you might be broken, but you know, Psalms uh, tell us that, you know, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There's always hope. There's never a point of where we should give ourselves fully over to weeping and complaining and murmuring to the point where if nobody, you know, comes to our rescue and God doesn't do what we ask him to do or on the timing of what we expect him to do, we can't expect God to be at our beckoning. Oh yes, he listens to our every cry and every need is being met by him. He says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. But see, you and I can leave the Lord like Israel is steadily and slowly leaving him, backsliding, weeping and complaining right now. And then here's the next step. Number three, they begin to give in to self-pity. What happens here? They, they said, if only we had died in the wilderness, right? In the land of Egypt. Friend, do you remember what it was like where you came from before? Before you prayed that prayer, before you dedicated your life to Jesus and made him not only your savior, but your Lord? Do you remember what it was like to live with that needle in your arm or that empty bottle every day in, the, you know, in your vehicle or, or next to your chair watching TV and being depressed and suicidal thoughts? Friend, I want to tell you something. When people are truly set free, it's hard to backslide. But if we're not really set free and we come to Jesus on our terms and we don't come on his terms and we think we're just going to fit him into our lives, friend, that's not how it works. You see, you can backslide from the very beginning if you've never really slid him forward in the first place. You can, you can, you know, not really be running your race, but mouth confession, but not really repent. You can make up in your mind, a God that doesn't exist. And that's breaking the first and second commandment. No other gods before me and no idols. We cannot make up a form of godliness in our image. We were created in his image. He's not created in our image. We have to embrace what God is doing in us and weeping, complaining, self-pity. You know what self-pity is? It's feeding our flesh more than our spirit. And it's easy for us, even as Christians, to give in to self-pity. Nobody understands what I'm going through, the financial hardship I'm going through, the sickness I'm dealing with. People don't have the same testimony of abuse or situations that I've went through. And friend, I'm, I'm going to tell you, he's the most compassionate and gracious and loving God there is. And maybe people won't always understand, but you and I never have the right to complain, to give in to self-pity. And to feed our flesh to the point where we become so full in our flesh that we don't even hunger and thirst for more of the Lord anymore. Amen? And then the next point here is number four, ungodly thoughts, strongholds, you know, that begin to darken our minds. And, and in verse three of Numbers 14, it says, Israel says, why has the Lord brought us to this land? To fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? It would be better for us to return to Egypt. Do you hear what they're saying? 
Not only have they been weeping and complaining and giving into self-pity, but now there's ungodly thoughts that are entering into their minds that they're entertaining. And they're beginning to become a stronghold. It's like cement being beginning to harden in their mind and in their heart. And they're not, you know, their minds aren't clear anymore. It's dark. It's ugly. And now... They're just thinking not on whatsoever things are pure, honorable, lovely, holy, just, things of virtue, things of praise. They're not thinking on those things. They're thinking on, what can I do for me? What can God do for me? How can I get God to do what I need him to do? Friend, you're never going to get God to do what you think he should do for you. That's why we come to him on his terms. And we come to him and say, Lord, renew my mind. When, I'm, when we're born again, Scripture says that we receive the mind of Christ. And Romans 12 says that we need to renew our minds with the word of the Lord. Friend, look, being a Christian is not easy. Being a, or what I should say is being a disciple of Jesus is not easy. It requires effort, a daily effort on my part and your part to resist the enemy, and he will flee to resist ungodly thoughts, to cast down every thought and imagination that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God in our lives. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And, and tear down these strongholds. That, that We shouldn't even allow these negative ungodly thoughts to get into our minds through weeping, complaining, and self-pity. Because this is what it leads to next, negative confession number five negative confession you know we may still hear the voice of conviction but our confession begins to change have you ever sensed the convicting power of the holy spirit but out of your mouth you're saying things and doing things that you know are not godly and it's not what the lord has called you to do and that's what Israel's doing there. They've got negative thoughts and and now they're there are ungodly thoughts and now they have a negative confession. Do you think that God brought them to the land of Canaan to destroy them? No, that's why the men who went in there and have a different spirit said, Look, we can take this. In other words, it's a faith walk, no matter where you are in life. No matter if you're married, single, with kids, a job, missionary, overseas, in the U.S., wherever you are, that you and I have control. We have the fruit of this. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. We have the ability to cast down these thoughts and imaginations and, this, and to not think that it was God's desire to destroy our families in whatever we're called to do for him. Look, I don't know about you, but we've been missionaries, you know, for 18 years in the Philippines. And when we first went there, we didn't know what to expect. We never had been there. And we went on a short-term trip before for two weeks. But I mean, you don't know what it's like to live in another culture and adjust and, and, and deal with your own selfish arrogance and issues when you're around people who are totally different or grew up different. But yet, we all have the same sin problems. And I found when we first moved to the Philippines, a lot of my flesh was coming up that God was trying to crucify so that he could do something in and through us to reach those that he loves. You see, if we have negative thoughts, ungodly thoughts controlling our lives and negative confession, nobody's going to want what we have. Listen, let me finish this up here. Number six, the next dangerous step of backsliding is that we're willing to go backwards. We make conscious decisions to sin. Israel is saying it's better for us to return to Egypt. Friend, in Egypt, they were slaves. If you are living in sin, you are a slave to sin. Look that up. Look what Paul says in Romans about that uh, sin should not be our master. Isn't that what God told, you know, uh, when Cain killed Abel? 
Didn't he say, sin must not be your master, but you're going to be a vagabond. You're going to roam the earth and, and not have any real purpose. You're going to have to till the ground and, and, and it's going to be hard for you wherever you go. Oh, friend, God doesn't want us to live in sin because when we're enslaved by sin, it is a horrible master. And it treats us, you know, with pain and suffering and has no care or concern. And we know the one who is the prince of darkness is the enemy, is the devil, is Satan. And his demons, his minions that are trying to control and, and establish ungodly thoughts in our minds and confession so that he can lead us to a place of falling back into sin. Friend, there's nothing back there for you and me. I want to encourage you today to know that Jesus loves you. That no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, even if you're what if you're not a Christian or you love Jesus but have backslidden, I want you to know that today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of repentance. Today is a day to get right with God. Don't put off another moment. It's time for you to enter into your promised land. Amen. Last point here idolatry. Number seven, dangerous steps of backsliding. Let me go through it real quickly again, just to summarize. First is weeping. Second, complaining. Third, self-pity. Fourth, ungodly thoughts. Number five, negative confession. Number six, willing to go backwards. And number seven, idolatry. Sin becomes our identity. Listen to what Israel says in uh, Numbers 14, verse 4. So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. What are they saying? They're saying Moses brought us to this place to kill us. We don't believe that he and Aaron are worthy to be leading anymore. And yet what happens? They say in their ungodly thoughts and confessions and complaining and murmuring and uh, arguing, they say, we need another leader. No, what they're saying is we want to be in control and we're going to say who is going to lead us. This Moses and Aaron guy, they're not going to lead us anymore. We're the ones who are calling the shot. Friend, you and I are not the one who's calling the shot. Jesus is. And maybe some of you need to hear this word today. You need to see yourself as needing three types of people in your life. I heard Richard Crisco from Youth Pastor from the Brownsville Revival say this over 20 years ago, and I never forgot it. Everyone needs a Paul, everyone needs a Barnabas, and everybody needs a Timothy in their life. What does Paul represent? A mentor. Men, women of God who speak into your life, who, who are holding you accountable, who are challenging you, who are loving you and rebuking you if necessary. Barnabas, people that encourage you, and, and want to be your friend and all those things, right? And then a Timothy, someone you're pouring into. When we live in sin, we don't care about pouring into any other people anymore. We don't even care about, uh, you know, Barnabas's encouragers. We want to isolate ourselves and be in control. And this is what Israel is doing. They're isolating themselves from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though they know that he raised up Moses to lead them, they are now rejecting who God has placed over them. And listen, my friend, there are some of you today that need to hear this word. You're charismatic, you're Pentecostal, whatever you are, and you're sitting in a church and you're thinking, my pastor just don't understand what's going on or they don't value me or they don't see my gifts and calling. Friend, I want to tell you something. Don't rise up with pride. If you and I would learn about humility and meekness, Jesus said the meek would inherit the earth. It's a faith walk. If you don't feel respected, if you don't feel honored, I want to tell you something today. That's probably because there's pride. And if it's an issue where you haven't been respected or disrespected, you don't disrespect people back. You honor them. You honor them above yourself. You love them. You care for them. Even those who hurt you. Even Jesus said that we should love our enemies. Oh, friend, there's no point for you and I becoming idols. I've heard of so uh, allowing idols to control our lives. There's no point in 
dividing a church and going to start another work somewhere else because you feel dishonored or you're bitter or you have unforgiveness. There's entire movements of people, churches, congregations, denominations that are divided because somebody was offended. And so they want to pull everybody else into their offense by creating a whole new thing because of their charismatic ability, their speaking ability, their singing ability, the money, whatever. It's trash. And friend, I want to tell you something. Jesus will deal with that stuff one day. And I want to encourage you today to cast down every idol to cast down anything that you would try to exalt yourself. Dr. Michael Brown, our spiritual father, would always say to us, don't kick doors open, let God open up the doors. Let him do it. Friend, if it's not a faith walk, you're not going to have a testimony. And if you don't have a testimony and you get somewhere where you think you've arrived, I'm just telling you, you got up to a mountain where you climbed yourself and God didn't help you get up there. And you might think that he did, but he's never going to ignore unforgiveness and bitterness and control and fear. I'm telling you, friend, he's a God of peace, love and joy and faithfulness and truth. And he's going to speak to us straight because he loves us. And he is more concerned about us being set free from sin than he is about using us. Because, friend, if he can use a donkey, he can use anybody. Listen, we're coming into the last minute of our time together today, but I want to leave this scripture with you. In Romans six fourteen. Paul says, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Are you under grace today? From the grace of God is sufficient for you and me. And whatever our situation is, Father, I'm so grateful for those listening today. And I pray if there's anybody who's backsliding that is in the sound of listening to the sound of my voice today, that you would draw them back into relationship with you. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace upon our lives. Even though we don't deserve it, you are still faithful to us. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, friend, thank you so much for being with us today. My prayer is that you would be encouraged and strengthened and going deeper in your walk with God than you ever have before. Listen, send us an email, info at revivalcry.org. Let us know that you're listening and we praise God and thank you for your prayers and support. God bless you.